Good day, everyone. Before we move on to our episode for today, uh, some a few announcements. This episode is sponsored by Mrs. Bean Coffee. So, Matt, what can you say about our new source of caffeine? Well, we are very excited to have this brand because Mrs. Bean Coffee sells locally grown beans from the Cordilleras and Mindanao. So it comes from our very own Philippine soil. And they sell different kinds of blends such as Sagada, Arabica, Benguet, Kalinga, Robusta, and Premium Baraco Iberica. And they also have flavored drip coffee. So they have flavors such as vanilla, mocha, caramel, and my personal favorites, butterscotch and Irish cream. And the other good thing about it is they come at very affordable prices. But those prices are about to be more affordable if you use the special code reserved only for PI podcast listeners. So para sa mga ka-PI lang. So the code is Mrs. BXPI. That's MRSBXPI, all capital letters. And you'll get a 15% discount voucher when you order your Mrs. Bean coffee. And it is available in Shopee or on Facebook. We have links to both. So please follow them in Facebook and Shopee. So tarana, kapiya na with Mrs. Bean. And now we proceed to our regular programming. Welcome to the PI Podcast, political insights for the Palaging Inis. I'm your host, Matt, and with me is my co-host, meme scientist and political lord, Bored. <laughs> okay, that, that was unexpected. To an extent, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm about to study <laughs> memes. <laughs> he studies memes and he's a political <laughs> lord. <laughs> PI nyo, PI nating lahat. Board share to your service. Yes, and we have this very special episode. We have been having a lot of content lately, but we felt it was really special. So after the Bonifacio Day special, we have the Hannah Arendt special. We're celebrating her death day. So what is it? So St. Anna Arendt. Uh, mo kami. <laughs> My goodness. So uh, before we move on, uh, Borch, what you know, we clearly we have a lot of respect for Miss Arendt. Miss Arendt, well, uh, what is your relationship with Miss Arendt? Well, relationship. Pakit pakinggan. <laughs> Pakit pakinggan. Uh, Hannah I mean, Arendt was have... married, you dipshit. <laughs> <laughs> so ikaw yung kabit. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Okay, okay. Uh, again, a few decades ago, uh, our society lost. Well, our human society lost one of its most incisive thinkers, uh, Hannah Arendt. Uh, what, what's my relationship with Arendt? Well, it, it goes a long way to an extent. You know, I remember spending my undergrad in the library reading uh, her works. But to, to be one more clear thing is that the, the first book that I bought with my own money was mm-hmm. Arendt's On Revolution. Ah, so, but then again, you know, uh, to, to be honest, uh, and I think this would be a warning to our listeners. Uh, mm-hmm. At first, I could not digest her arguments regarding revolutions mm-hmm. because, again, I was I was still trapped within the usual Marxist framework, and she mm-hmm. eventually she she obviously worked against the, the usual Marxist notions of revolution. Mm-hmm. So it was challenging. So it took some time for me to mature before I started reading Arendt again. So, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I, I think she's one of the thinkers that have influenced me more. I don't want to call her a philosopher again, because Arendt herself would have a beef with philosophy, and she would mm. like to be called a philosopher as well. And she said that explicitly. He's, she's a political theorist. Ooh. So, <laughs> but, but, God. <laughs> but, so, but, but what is the difference between a philosopher and a theorist then? Uh, it depends on the topic. And Arendt, uh, to an extent... So, and to an extent, accuse some political philosophers of relegating key notions like freedom uh, mm-hmm. into the level of individuals, when in fact she revived it, as we will discuss later on, that freedom mm-hmm. is essentially a collective thing. So she has a beef with some philosophers, and uh, but mm-hmm. she learned much from philosophers. And uh, if you have read Marx uh, properly, then you, you can also mm-hmm. see the influences of Marx, even Carl Jasper, see Heidegger as well, Aaron's work. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. What about you? When were you first exposed to Arendt? Exposed to Arendt? Well, like many of my influences, I was exposed in Ateneo de Manila University. I have a very, to say the least, strange relationship. But one of the things I did uh, appreciate is really, Arendt actually is quite a popular theorist in mm. Ateneo. It's not only used in political science, political theory, but also in the philo- my philosophy classes. Mm. And to a certain extent, some 
literature classes. So <laughs> their influence in particularly in like uh, political thinking in particular, or at least the uh, political thought is qu- uh, quite popular. And not only here, but I think a lot of the philosophy professors uh, imported Arendt from the liberal colleges and universities mm-hmm. in the United States. So she is also quite popular in u- American universities where she herself taught and toured or, and lectured mm-hmm. all, was after being exiled from Germany you know, as a Jewish philosopher. And, you know, uh, well, weirdly enough, while I was, many of my peers were grappling with Marx, I wasn't always comfortable mm-hmm. with Marx. And she was one of the few that actually critiqued him quite uh, effectively. And it's stuck with me today. So that led me to, I think the first one that I read was not on revolution, but I think was human condition. And mm. uh, our professor had us uh, read the preface of the human condition, which is like the earth uh, is the quintessence of human existence, which means mm. it's the, o- the only planet and it's the only way the, the only way we exist, you know? Mm. Um, so and, and she compared it to, to, going up on the, uh, into space. And that's when we finally realized that it's the only world we got. So mm. the, the, it's the planet that we share. And that's a very deep and poetic message. And it's weird mm. because he only, I think most of us only read the, the, the preface, mm. but eventually I read the entire book more than once, The Human Condition. Mm. And then of course, which led, we also read On Revolution, like you did, mm. as well as Origins of totalitarianism. So I think yeah. for one course, <laughs> it's a full course meal of Hannah Arendt. And so for this episode, I we want to share my... our love with uh, of Aaron Arendt with everyone. So spreading the gospel of Hannah Arendt. No, no, no. no but, the thing is, we, we, we're not really spreading the gospel. You know, uh, one one <laughs> I think thing. That's the point. Yeah, you're right. Well, one thing she that, wouldn't uh, appreciate yeah, the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Then her dissertation is on Saint Augustine, of course. So mm. well, we need to find that one. But you know, uh, one mm. trigger that we had in organizing this episode is that we are actually observing increase in sales for Aaron's mm-hmm. The Origins of Totalitarianism. Right. So when we are rummaging through uh, secondhand or, well, you know, first-hand bookstores online, we would see people yeah. piling up trying to get uh, Han Aaron's Origins mm-hmm. of Totalitarianism. And there's a growing interest. But uh, as I've said, there's also a danger in, you know, misinterpreting Aaron. Mm. So uh, she is... To an extent, uh, she transcends partisan lines, mm-hmm. and uh, her ideas constantly resist being appropriated. So, mm-hmm. uh, right. so yeah. So I, I think uh, one of our goals here is to not, not really set the record straight, really, but to elaborate on uh, key concepts. On that. And not only that, I mean, of course, I actually felt that because it took. I was been eyeing for a copy of I Committed in Jerusalem, one of her best, mm. one of her most famous works, yeah. and it took me like months. <laughs> because people keep get grabbing the copy. And for some reason, I come in Jerusalem. Why? It's, uh, well, that's it shows for the popularity. And I think um, it kind of asks us, like, is Hannah Arendt uh, applicable to the Philippine context? And that's mm. why we appropriately named this episode Arendt in Manila. Yeah. So what can we learn from Hannah Arendt as Filipinos with our current uh, situation yeah. politically and socially? You know? so, and of course, in particular with political thinking you know hannah arendt is highly original despite getting a lot of her (coughs) foundations from the greeks you know uh, she actually (coughs) critiqued her german peers uh, (coughs) nietzsche marx and even her ex who and she's actually famous for this for being the uh a bit or the, hey. the, the, or the <laughs> girlfriend the lover of martin heidegger who is a famous german philosopher who's also a nazi in fact that should that should be a part of a <clears throat> film but no but <laughs> anyway there we go but yeah uh but she not only critiqued the popular german philosophers you know that were slowly becoming more popular even in the american uh, <clears throat> continent but she also tried to talk about thinking itself. Yeah. So she's thought about thinking. And so yeah. we'll see what we can learn about thinking especially, and compare it to how the Philippines can uh, learn perhaps how to think a bit deeper, okay? Mm. Or uh, think better. But uh, Borg- Think more uh, critically would be more apt. Yeah. So, but before we get into the thoughts of Anna Arendt, let's try to contextualize like what Filipinos think about yeah. thinking. And I think mm. it's 
I think, it's clear that we have a very mixed record and relationship with thinking. <laughs> so n- number one, m- we usually equate it with, of course, uh, education. You know, and most people bemoan the fact that, number one, a lot of students underperform you know, <clears throat> when the a- na- international average is usually in standardized tests, it's about 400 plus. We are right there at the 390s. So it's still below the average. And so it's usually the quality of education. And by, by extension, it has caused people to not perform as well in their jobs. Mm. And of course, they extended to the logic of, you know, the phenomenon of bobotante. Uh, hindi sila educado, mm. kaya ganun sila bumoto. Kaya nananalo yung mga tao katulad ni Erap, katulad ni hey, hey, hey. Ni Dao. That's why certain populist win because they usually bemoan the lack of education and, of course, the lack of thinking. And that is why that there's also an emergence of quote, a quote-unquote thinking class. In fact, there is a, a page known as think, the thinking class in the Philippines. Like, what the hell? How pretentious. And there are also groups like the Filipino Free Thinkers, which has been well, which grew out shortly before, of course, the RH bill. A bunch of yeah. like people that were normally uh, restricted and uh, were frustrated by the conservative uh, society, you know, so there became there a group of atheists. And of course, you have the, the Get Real Philippines blog website, which talks of, about like having an educated stance, you know, and saying that, oh, this is what we should do, you know, so, so wake up Philippines, things like that. So, Borge, I, how can you comment on this parallel phenomena? And maybe do you have anything to Add with regards to the Filipinos' relationship to thinking. Well, you already said so much about it to an extent. Well, the current conditions. Mm-hmm. But uh, well, first and foremost, uh, Arendt's contribution to political theory and uh, mm-hmm. we can say that to philosophy itself is it's not only about her arguments on politics per se. Her primary her primary contribution is focused on how to think how to mm-hmm. think dangerously, and I think we can end with that one later on, but mm-hmm. what can Aaron say about our case and what can I say about it right now? Okay, let's, we, we can start with the latter. What can I say about this growth of, uh, or this proliferation of uh, thinking in public discourse? <clears throat> Again, mm-hmm. first and foremost, as you rightly said, this is a uh, backlash against the Bobotante discourse. Mm-hmm. So this is one thing that should be broken apart, and I think mm-hmm. Iron would agree. But it is not an uh, it is not a license for people to simply think without mm-hmm. any sense of discipline, without mm-hmm. any sense of depth, without any sense of self criticism. And I think that mm-hmm. is what Iron pinned down in many of her works, uh, some essays in Thinking Without the Banister. If you want to check that out, mm-hmm. her essays on <clears throat> introduction to politics as well. That it, thinking entails not only about looking outside but also looking at our own judgments, at our own mm-hmm. prejudgments, examining our assumptions, whether our assumptions are still true or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, are Filipinos, do we have a culture of thinking in such a way? That's the thing. Magmuni Muni would be one example. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's um, the band too. Yeah, magmu- <laughs> yeah God Muni damn it. But Magmuni uh, <laughs> Muni or to, to ponder on things. And, uh, mm-hmm. That's one part that I think is, uh, can allow us to th- mm-hmm. think deeply, that gives value to thinking deep- de- deeply. But then again, we have parodied thinking itself for philosophers. We have mm-hmm. philosophotage, the usual image of an absent-minded man. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, we have a mixed relationship with thinking. And mm-hmm. I th- and as far as I'm concerned, as far as ecology and <coughs> Filipino is concerned, we value thinking if it's only translatable into something practical. Mm-hmm. So yes. thinking is only of value to Filipinos if it is practical. Will Aaron agree with such a thing? Hmm. What do you think? Will Aaron <laughs> agree with? Will Will Aaron agree with uh, thinking as something that's supposed to be tied with something practical? Mm, you know, it does include that, but I think we'll, as we'll get into uh, her thought later on, I think it does not necessarily need to be practical. In yeah. fact, in some ways, it can be a passive activity. Uh, but and, and so I think that's what we want to challenge here. And I think the other thing I was trying to mention is, is does 
thinking requ- necessarily require a complete education because precisely mm. because these groups lord over votantes or value mm. their own works or their own words and their thoughts precisely because they're, they're more educated than most. They finished their education sometimes with advanced degrees and therefore, again, they bemoan that most of the country did not finish their education or even if they did finish it, it's, if they go, come from a public school, they usually snobbly reject them, you know, and so they're not up to par, um, which to an extent is actually objectively sad. You know, it's, we have an objectively bad education system because of lack of funding and lack of mm. Mm, reform. So there's, that's another thing we can talk about later on. And of course, we've already touched on with uh, JM in our previous episode. But mm. I, I, I want to ask you this, though. Yeah, does, necess- does thinking necessarily require education? Hmm. It depends on what type of education. Uh, education figures in Aaron's framework mm-hmm. more as a venue for people to practice thinking. But thinking, I think, for Aaron is uh, something that can be that you don't need to have formal education with, first and mm-hmm. foremost. But mm-hmm. thinking for Aaron appears to be more of a habit. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you would say that habits are formed by education, not necessarily formal, but mm-hmm. at least we go to the Confucian idea of self-cultivation that in order for mm-hmm. you to form habits, <clears throat> I think that will also be open to that idea. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> there's a line between thinking and education between Aaron. They're distinct mm-hmm. for her. Mm-hmm. At the very least, thinking and education is dis- are distinct for mm-hmm. Aaron. Mm, yeah. Uh, and I just want to quote this from her main b- work on thinking. I mean, she talks about thinking across her works, but her main authoritative text is The Life of the Mind, which is unfortunately a unfinished three-volume work. But the first thing when she talks about thinking, one thing she says is, what are we doing when we do nothing but think? When we are, when we normally always surrounded by our fellow men are together with no one but ourselves. And in fact, you know, she even said elsewhere that, yeah, thinking <coughs> is kahit nakatuwanga ka lang. So, you know, we can talk more about that later on, but thinking can be passive. You know, thinking can be done even in, in isolation. So, yeah. But... Yeah, we'll elaborate the, more on that one later We'll elaborate on. more on that later Because on, uh, yeah. that uh, thinking is tied with her concepts, key concepts, her key take on politics. So you really cannot separate thinking from politics. So I think mm-hmm. now, before we move on to thinking further, mm-hmm. we can uh, look at some key concepts that mm-hmm. she tackles. One uh, important concept is her distinct definition of what the political is mm. and she normally t- talks about po- uh, relating it with politics and mm. freedom and that you can only uh, be free in relation to each other and, and this is, comes from her work uh, well her lecture the freedom to be free and people can only be free in relation to one another and so and she further goes to say that you can only be free in politics uh, can you elaborate on this further, Borch? Have you encountered mm-hmm. this concept with politics and freedom? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding politics for Aaron, mm-hmm. as far as her introduction to politics is concerned, you can find that in The Promise of Politics, <clears throat> along with uh, her examinations on it in The Human Condition. Mm-hmm. But it appears that for Aaron, <clears throat> this is something that I must make clear to our listeners before you mm-hmm. start reading Aaron. Mm-hmm. Politics for Aaron means two things. And again, she's defining it based on classics. So we, that, that's mm-hmm. a disclaimer that we must make. Arendt, as a political theorist, is a classicist. Not mm-hmm. classicist na, you know, class superiority, but classicist in terms of going back to the classics. Mm-hmm. So for her, politics means the realm of appearance. You know, mm-hmm. as far as ancient Greece and ancient Rome is concerned, this is the place mm-hmm. where people make themselves appear. Mm-hmm. Okay, make themselves appear in public via their speech, and mm-hmm. uh, through their action, so she goes back to the old Aristotelian uh, notion of uh, language, logos, uh, as both language and reason. So, so yeah, uh, politics as this realm of appearance. So there are things that mm-hmm. do not appear, and those are things that are in the private sphere. That's mm-hmm. why she reasserts the distinction between public and private. And again, we go back to our old episode of everything is political. So mm-hmm. we said that everything can be politicized and not everything is political because there's always a realm that does not appear. Mm-hmm. Okay? That, that does not appear. Okay? So 
This what is are the her- things that do not appear? <laughs> well, first and foremost, your biological structure. Mm-hmm. And unless you show to the public your X-rays, <laughs> no one would fucking mm-hmm. know. So, so yeah, there are things that are essentially not appearing. But in order Perhaps for you to what a more important distinction, like for example, mm-hmm. your dynamics with your family, people need not know about it. Yeah, and yet, uh, unless magawi ka sa have, oh, unless yeah. So these are also for interpersonal, mm-hmm. but they're not necessarily political. And I think that's what we have to reassert, despite. Well, we've already talked about this in our PI row. Everything is political, mm. but it's not. Mm. It's, she makes that distinction that mm. what is political is uh, public. Mm. And just to go back, and I think the, as politics being related to freedom, it, she also says that eventually we go into politics in order to, to be free from politics. So part of no, being no, 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 politics... No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, why? Wait, wait, it's wait. It's part of here. Yeah. No, no, no. I need to correct you on that. Uh, that's one thing that she criticized. Hmm. Politics is freedom. Yes. It's just not an escape from politics. Okay. That's one thing. Is, okay. Regarding politics it, and freedom for Aaron, mm-hmm. they're one and the same. Mm-hmm. To act in a free sense is to be political already. It's mm-hmm. to make yourself appear. Now, this mm-hmm. is a criticism of two things. First, right. uh, the criticism of the argument that politics is a necessary evil that we can avoid. And that freedom mm-hmm. is freedom from politics. That's one thing that she criticizes. Okay. Right. It's not that one. So, uh-huh. and the other one is <clears throat> criticizing the idea that you can actually escape from politics through by being free. That's the liberal mm. argument that freedom mm-hmm. is the realm that is outside politics. Yeah. So she criticizes both and says that mm-hmm. as far as the classics are concerned, politics mm-hmm. is freedom. So, and she gets a lot of it from, of course, the, the Aristotelian tradition. So yeah. that's important. Mm, with regards, so what does he, how does he again define uh, the public and private? Now, why is this important? Mm. Why make this distinction? Why not say everything is political? Because I think that's what, um, uh, that, well, we've mentioned this before, but by the collapsing the distinction between mm. public and private, you know, people tend to uh, say that, oh, you definitely have no choice but to be political. That's mm. why they want, they, they make that frame so that they can convince you to be on their side. And mm. it is, yeah, yeah. you know, it's for your own benefit, you know, mm. for your own survival sometimes. Yeah. But why this distinction? Why this according distinction? to Aaron? Mm. Well, this is a reflection again of, well, her understanding of Athenian politics, which, in, uh, which is there are parts of society that are hidden and that those hidden are basically the basis for one to participate in politics. Mm-hmm. So the household would be there, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think what you are trying to pin down would be the, the next, the, 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 the essence of politics for Aaron, which mm-hmm. is politics is freedom. Politics is the realm of appearance. Mm-hmm. The next thing that she argues is politics is based on plurality, that there could mm-hmm. be no politics without plurality. Mm-hmm. And that plurality, to an extent, is something that a person shares Mm-hmm. And a person harnesses or, the, or, per, or something that emerges out of the private realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm trying to remember which in particular, but she also says that, and this made actually hmm. um, made me a bit emotional when I read it, and that each individual is unique and has the potential to create something new. Hmm. And that capacity to create something new is the basis of her theory of action. Yeah. So action is being able to do something that's new and has not been manifested before. Yeah. Uh, so, and she contrasts that to perhaps, um, well, to the society that's not free when people act just like Everyone one another, else. when there's a uniform yeah. thought, you wear the same thing, you think the same way. And mm. I suppose that's what elections do, especially right now. Mm. And I think, well, uh, I'll give an example, mm. perhaps, the fact that there are not that many undecideds mm. is because mm. our society is so, what's the word? Polarized. Uh, well, so polarized that they've already picked their sides one way or another, probably because mm. their parents or their friends or their workmates even mm. support a particular candidate, you know, they feel pressure to do so. Mm. Uh, but for, I think for Aaron, you know, that's related to her thinking, which we, we'll talk about later on is that uh, it's try to, trying to manifest one's own one's own thoughts even mm. that's making your own it's funny thing it's about uh manifesting your individuality yeah you know yeah that is the greek 
Greek uh, ideal that uh, Aaron mm-hmm. reasserts. Uh, mm-hmm. To be political is to act freely, and to act freely is to do or to have the capacity to do something new. That's uh, mm-hmm. I think that's the indicator that she pinpointed uh, mm-hmm. in order to measure what freedom is. Freedom is the capacity to do something new, as far as the Greek standards mm-hmm. are concerned. Right. That's how you appear when you create something new, and uh, that's also an assertion of your individuality. So mm-hmm. the thing is, uh, I I think you can agree with this one that. Uh, for Arendt, there must be a balance between individuality mm-hmm. and the collective pursuit of what is mm-hmm. good. I do have a question, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, we know that the Philippines ha- does have a, a, a collective culture. The mm-hmm. thing about Bayanihan yeah. and um, Pakikisama. Well, yeah. they both have well positive and negative traits, like to mm-hmm. the point where, like, okay, it helps people. You know, join together, band together, having a common good time, you know, an agreement and consensus, but also to the point where sometimes when, when the, the, the collective does something bad, mm-hmm. na lang. or sometimes when you have, even when you have been wrong, you kind of put that aside. So, mm-hmm. what do you, is there, do you think that there might be the, this tension between this collective um, inclination in Philippine mm-hmm. culture with Hannah Arendt's thought and individuality, which is quite Western? Uh, I think, no, because even Arendt did not resolve the conflict between the individual mm-hmm. and the collective in her, mm-hmm. in her thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, she leaves that to politics itself. So mm-hmm. she has enough decency not to resolve such a fundamental problem only by thinking mm-hmm. about it. She leaves it to the actual activity. So mm-hmm. uh, if we have contradictions right now between individuality and collective behavior, mm-hmm. that fits well in Arendt because uh, mm-hmm. Arendt would say that let the contradictions run its course. You don't Mm-hmm. You don't need to repress it. You don't need to repress either individuality or mm-hmm. you don't need to repress collective behavior because that's mm-hmm. the point of politics. Is this mm-hmm. is this the, the field, this dynamic it, field wherein the individual and the collective interact. You know? And negotiate. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Where, when uh, individuals negotiate with one another, mm-hmm. uh, they can negotiate or, with the collective itself. Well, not necessarily. Well, not necessarily, but precisely when the boundaries of the individual and the collective will are negotiated, mm, yeah, yeah. As, as long as there's that interaction, then yeah, yeah that's political. Okay. Uh, now, regards to that collapse of the public mm. and private, I suppose we can move on to the next important idea, and I think this is one of the uh, best-selling books to the point where it is constantly available and mm-hmm. even prominently featured in fully booked which yeah. is the origins of totalitarianism. And it has a great, uh, a great cover, by the way, but yeah. let's not judge it by its cover. It's still great. But mm. uh, so, of course, she used this to discuss the emergence of anti-Semitism and mm. the rise of uh, Hitler and the Nazis. So what is her, what's her diagnosis of this phenomenon, which was unprecedented, actually? What does she mean by totalitarianism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we... Yeah, I think we already brushed aside. We already brushed upon it a while ago mm-hmm. regarding the repression of things. Mm-hmm. So again, uh, politics is founded on freedom, appearances, mm-hmm. and of course, plurality. Mm. A totalitarianism for Hannah Arendt is this anti-political tendency mm-hmm. wherein you collapse the public with the private, you politicize everything, mm-hmm. and by doing so, you repress plurality. Mm-hmm. You try to make everyone the same. So... Totalitarian movements, yes, Arendt recognized that it is violent, can be mm-hmm. violent. But the essence of totalitarianism lies not in the mechanisms of repression, but in the rationale. And mm-hmm. for Arendt, and this is something that she exposed, the rationale is this. You mm-hmm. eliminate plurality. You resolve the contradiction between individual and collective by eliminating mm-hmm. differences. Mm-hmm. So that com- yeah, yeah, that comes from that root word of totalitarianism, which is it's totalizing. Yeah, and it, it part of being made part into a whole. So yeah. there is no no more difference. Yeah, and that's what she, I think. This she tried to conceptualize what she has been fighting all along. Of mm. course, she herself as both a German and a Jew. Mm. She, in a way, come to think of it, to be a German and a Jew at the same time mm. kind of, is trying to resolve like part of you is uh, oppressed another part of you yeah and she also talked about like her people on why why would why why did people commit such atrocities to her yeah to the jews Hmm. um when trying to resolve that you know totalitarianism 
reduce the Jews' humanity completely. Mm. With, um, and I think the weird thing about when I re- was reviewing the origins of totalitarianism, it's weird. It's totalitarianism and power. I think she, I'm paraphrasing here. Mm. It's no longer about convincing people. People, it's just a merely a matter of organization. Do you know about that line? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to convince people. That's weird because they, they, it's part of like assuming it as fact that yeah. the Jews are to blame hmm. for Germany's uh, uh, slow growth and poor conditions because they are, there's a conspiracy and therefore they must be destroyed. And it's the Nazi party that is meant to uh, bring forth this hmm. change of history. So do you have anything to but add the, to that? Yeah, the, the, that's for the case of the Nazis. But mm-hmm. Arendt also tackled the case of Stalin's Russia. Mm-hmm. So while Hitler reduced everything to the issue of race for Stalin, reducing mm-hmm. everything to the issue of classes. Mm-hmm. So you try to create a single class state. Mm-hmm. That is totalizing on one hand mm-hmm. classes right. one class is just one part of a society mm-hmm. but the uh, the crucial thing is about that one it's not only it's totalizing it's it also represses plurality that you cannot be mm-hmm. anything other than a worker mm-hmm. and what it veils is that there's always someone who is more powerful that's that's the thing about totalitarianism uh, mm-hmm. why why is it how is it different from authoritarianism first and foremost authoritarianism is you have the authority, everyone else is equal. <laughs> so everyone else is mm-hmm. equal, but you have the single authority above it. Mm-hmm. But totalitarianism, it's just flattening out everything mm-hmm. into, a single, yeah. into a single category. And, uh, you know, the implications of this one, as far as the politics in Soviet Russia is concerned, is to an extent uh, uh, savage. Not, mm-hmm. not, all, not, not savage in terms of, not only in terms of killing people, but in mm-hmm. terms of the toxic relationships among even the mm. elite. So mm. if, if everything is flat, everything is up for grabs, you, you, you simply just can, you know, can eliminate everyone at the whim. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, everyone else, everyone else, and uh, this, this is something, uh, everyone else is just there to watch. So, mm. But, you know, I think the allure of this mm. tendency is be- it simplifies everything. It makes everything black and white. It makes yeah. everything straightforward. And in a way, it removes the necessity for thinking. It removes yeah. the necessity for doubt. Oh, for doubt, even. Doubt is really, very much related to thinking. So, yeah. and you find these kinds of simplifying tendencies in Philippine culture or in Philippine politics. Is there yeah. manifestations of totalitarianism? Uh, we don't have it. A- do we have a totalitarian movement in the Philippines? Do we have a totalitarian movement in the Philippines? I, I think I can leave that to our listeners. You can answer mm-hmm. that one. Do we have a totalitarian movement? Well, do we have totalitarian there are, movements? There are, compar- there are comparisons yeah. of Duterte and Hitler, and Hitler uh, was an identified totalitarian movement, you know, well, at least him and the Nazi party, mm-hmm. according to Aaron. So is, do you think the DDS is, and even the, maybe even the Marcos Apologists, uh, can they be considered totalitarian? Anyone who tries to repress diversity and demean anyone else mm-hmm. can be guilty of totalitarian tendencies. So I will not there reduce it go. to the DDS and to the Marcos apologists. Ah, so anyone, so yeah, anyone who would try to demean mm-hmm. uh, the individuality of someone or mm-hmm. anyone who would try to demean a certain sector for the sake of mm-hmm. you know, uniformity or whatever mm. they think is right. So mm. that, that's the thing. When you close negotiations to what you think is good and what is right, mm. you are eliminating politics. And by trying ah. to eliminate politics, you are going along a totalitarian path. Because again, mm. let me repeat for our listeners, to those who haven't read or just totalitarianism, totalitarianism is an anti-political tendency. You mm. eliminate politics. You, do, you don't respect politics. You see mm. politics, it's diversity, it's mess. Politics is messy, Jesus. Eh? Even mm. Aaron knows that. Uh, yeah. It's messy. The, the, the contradiction between individuals and collectives, among collectives, mm-hmm. among individuals, it's messy. But when you try to eliminate it, either by strong men or by a sense of righteousness, mm-hmm. if you try to eliminate it, you are walking along the path, the same yeah. path trodden by the likes of Stalin and Hitler. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. do we have totalitarian tendencies in the Philippines? <laughs> I'll leave the uh, audience to yeah. judge about and that. And just 
then just to balance that out, there's even this, I think we talked about this before, mm-hmm. this slogan that emerged. And it's a good thing that yeah, 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 yeah. Lenny supporters kind of bash this. It's the, I think, therefore, I'm pink uh, <laughs> slogan. And it even has the University of the Philippines ablation which logo, which is like, oh, mga taga-UP, nag-iisip. Kaya, ano, nag, uh, nag- but I'm like, well, the fact that you reduce all thinking people to think for Lenny is simplifying things. You know, I mean, that's that's actually a terrible thing to think of, to think about. You know, so it's just a terrible thing to 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 preach. It's not only yeah. thinking; they actually preached it. They, they actually yeah. have a tarpaulin for it. Yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and uh, it's weird that the Philippine. I mean, the Filipinos questioned. Uh, even their candidates, you know. For, I mean, sometimes hmm. can you argue that uh, what's going on with elections is multiple totalitarian movements competing? Mm. That could be. That's an that can that 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 uh, that's a possibility. That's a hypothesis. Mm. But regarding yeah. what you said, regarding what you said, that Filipinos can actually criticize their own candidates. Uh, mm. Just a, just a, just a tangent, Pete's tangent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Filipinos have the great capacity to excuse their candidates. Mm-hmm. And you know this capacity to excuse is in part based on what you said, mm-hmm. that we do criticize our candidates. So mm-hmm. before we excuse them, we criticize them. Mm-hmm. So do we have totalitarian movements in the Philippines? Is the upcoming elections based on uh, totalitarian tendencies? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have yet to see. But mm-hmm. uh, Aaron would probably say that, or would probably pinpoint whoever mm-hmm. is trying to eliminate politics. Right. Trying to eliminate the mess of politics by simplifying or mm-hmm. uh, absolutizing or reducing mm-hmm. something to, you know, just a single category or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Right. So. Actually, it could be, I think, it, you know, I talked about this before, but even totalitarianism mm-hmm. can manifest itself even in liberalism, don't you think? Is there such a thing as a liberal totalitarianism or maybe among progressives? Well, even, well, a recent study by Pippa Norris and Ronald Inglehart actually recognized mm-hmm. that even liberals can be autocratic in a sense of mm-hmm. being uh, intolerant, being uh, mm-hmm. domineering, and trying to, mm-hmm. you know, regulate ideas circulating around. So totalitarianism as a tendency is not exclusive to an ideology. Mm-hmm. That's one thing that is clear in Hannah Arendt's work. Mm-hmm. It is not exclusive to fascism. It's not exclusive mm-hmm. to Nazism. It's not exclusive mm-hmm. to socialism. It's a tendency, mm-hmm. and even the even the most liberal of all of all ideologies can actually be infected by such a tendency, mm-hmm. as long as they're trying to eliminate politics. And for example, right. if if you have a technocratic ideology, if you want intellectuals mm-hmm. to lead the country and mm-hmm. eliminate politics altogether, mm-hmm. that is totalitarian. Mm-hmm. Or if you want or a milder version of it is that uh-huh. all discussions should be exclusive to those who quote unquote think mm-hmm. then that is also anti-political mm-hmm. actually there's this common uh, this is common thing that's emerging right now it's called tapos ng usapan like even in something like hindi corrupt si Lenny tapos ng usapan <laughs> or, or even that's what uh, Bombo Marcos said it was like uh, mga kasinungalingan lang yan you know Tapos ng usapan, you know, like I've all, I've already disproved that, you know, and that's what they use. So the fa- the capacity, well, the tendency to shut debate down on certain mm. topics is in itself one aspect of totalitarianism, if not totalitarianism it's, itself. Yeah, it's tempting. It's mm-hmm. actually tempting to end conversations. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, we need to recognize that one. If you're mm-hmm. pissed off about. You know, and mindless discussions, mindless debates, mm-hmm. or endless mm-hmm. debates. It's understandable. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I will not condemn anyone who is pissed off by such uh, by such uh, instances. And we have mm-hmm. had enough of it. You know, as a society, right. we, have, we have had enough of it. Mm-hmm. But to say that to, to eliminate conversation itself, people must be aware of the costs. Mm-hmm. You know, f- people must be aware of the cost. If you say that tapos lang usapan, yet you still claim to represent freedom, mm-hmm. you're either delusional or an idiot. So, so, yeah, you need to be aware of the cost. So if you're willing mm-hmm. enough to say na tapos na ang usapan on certain issues, mm-hmm. then you are tr- threading the path of anti-political tendencies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think it has been embedded in our culture, the fact that sometimes, per- perhaps even in Filipino parents, I think mm-hmm. we, you and I are 
yeah. blessed with parents who aren't as authoritative, but it's a typical Filipino parent uh, that says, "Oi, respetuin mo yung uh, mga matanda or yeah. something." So you, you, yeah, you can't even talk back to your elders, yeah. which yeah, is yeah, yeah. not not exclusive to yeah. our culture, but it's part of that tendency. But again, politics is it's all messy. about discussion, you <laughs> yeah. know, and I think that's uh, well. We have to also uh, recognize that Hannah Arendt says that the Uh, the relationship among citizens is among equals, which yeah. means that uh, that's of of course from the the Greek ideal, wherein you can talk to each other and even criticize each other mm. as equals, regardless of rank or age. Mm. You know that's the beauty of politics; you can be yeah. equalized. But I, I think so. that should be you know uh, that's one one of my misgivings about Aaron mm. regarding uh, her arguments on equality. Mm-hmm. Theoretically, yes. Mm-hmm. But uh, we must have mechanisms to ensure that that level of equality actually exists. So you have, mm. uh, we go back to civic education would be there mm-hmm. actual. And this is a problem that's already been tackled by succeeding theorists who pondered mm-hmm. on how can, how, can you, how can you base politics on a conversation of equals? Mm-hmm. Uh, then you must have equalizing uh, mechanisms in place. May it be education, mm-hmm. may it be economic equal, equalizing mechanisms, political equality, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So, major, I think Aaron left that out uh, mm-hmm. as far as my own understanding is concerned. So, she assumes that mm-hmm. it is an ideal, but again, uh, equality right now is more of an ideal than a reality for men. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so, that's also a challenge for anyone who yeah. are trying to base their arguments on Aaron. Uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's a limitation that she has. Really. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I just remembered like having these conversations mm-hmm. as equals, you know, framing it as equals, and which we discussed in mm-hmm. episode three. Check that out if you haven't. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that it, it's even been promoted by Jordan Peterson, which is weird. Mm-hmm. Like it's about uh, being able to steal man each other's points. You mm-hmm. know, you should be able to even strengthen the point of your the op- your opponent. Mm. So to recognize the truth within their argument and to understand, of course, the truth of your own, you know, because yeah. if you don't, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember who said this, but if you don't understand uh, the opposite side, you don't understand your own side. Mm. So um, it, that that's, so that's one of the rules of Jordan Peterson, like assume what the other person knows something you do not, you know, and yeah. that's one equalizing tendency, which is perhaps philosophical, yeah. you know, and personal, but, but uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to bring up in, Pol- polit- politics lalo na kapag galit na galit ka sa taong yun so ibang kampo <laughs> sa ibang kandidato na parang <laughs> so try to find the truth in that person you know kahit, and you know uh, yeah. kahit yung mga BBM or uh, DDS di ba nakatunahan no. ba sinasabi nila di ba yeah, and, uh, you know what I again that's the blind spot in Aaron's theory mm-hmm. her take on equality and political equality is a bit you know more too idealistic and not realistic mm-hmm. enough and I would not blame Anyone who is pissed off at the other camp because the other camp says bullshit, I, w- I will not blame them. I would not blame either camp. I would blame the education system that have failed to provide this equalizing mechanism, which is you mm. provide people with uh, similar capacities in analyzing uh-huh. reality. So mm. some people ha- have lopsided capacities to, to mm-hmm. analyze real- reality. Some have better capacities to analyze reality. It's not their fault. Mm-hmm. It's the fault of the education system. Mm-hmm. So, in then, so I, I, Jordan, yes, uh, I mean, she's talked about education so far, but I think the education system has yet to incorporate what Hannah Arendt defines as thinking. And I suppose we can yeah, uh, yeah. start with our final uh, segment, which is what does Hannah Arendt think about thinking? And we kind of already <laughs> said that. Where yeah. it's both, it can be an active process, which you, yeah. which means you can actively think, and it can also be quite mm. passive, which means kahit wala kang ginagawa, nakatunga ka lang. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's ang iisip ka na, uh, which in a way highlights the man's capacity to think as a thinking creature. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Borge, what do you remember yeah. about Tana Aaron's more precise definition of thinking? Besides, of course, being both active and passive. No, no, I think that would be it. But for practice, in practice, and I think this would be mm-hmm. your contribution. How can you practice thinking? Mm-hmm. Well, what's the appropriate way to think about reality? So, mm-hmm. I'm. Looking at it from now, uh, from the book, uh, Thinking Without the Banister, these are uh, essays in mm-hmm. understanding. So if you want to right. check it out. I'm looking at the letter that she wrote to Robert Hutchins. And the first mm. part of it is that, uh, how in constant do you think about certain things? Mm-hmm. So how do you draw conclusions from reality? So 
Mm. Uh, she says, and I'm going to quote, uh, I therefore am inclined to believe that the best order to follow is the one drawn up by reality itself. That means uh, mm. you, you start with what is real. You know? you, yeah. But then again, you, the, the first part of that one, she's responding to her previous argument, which is mm-hmm. you do not settle with appearances. Mm. You need to go to the essence of things. And this is something that she mm-hmm. got from Marx. You know, that's why mm-hmm. I said that Marx's influence on Hannah Arendt to an extent may be observable. Mm-hmm. You need to go to the essence mm-hmm. of things. So you start with the surface. Yes, that's fine. You start with how things appear, uh, mm-hmm. but you need to go to the essence of things. For example, if you're pissed off about someone's wrong facts, you know, uh, mm-hmm. someone's spouting out fake news, fine, mm-hmm. you can start with that. Say that that person is spouting out fake news, but you need mm-hmm. to ask why and how. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's that's going down. That's going deeper. Is is, is mm-hmm. that person spouting out fake news to support an idea, to support an advocacy, or it's just plain and simple trolling? So you need to ask that one. Mm-hmm. But for Aaron, you need to go as deep as attempting. Uh, I would quote this one: "It may be possible to attempt the otherwise forbidding task of re-examining mm-hmm. basic ideas and traditionally rooted concepts." So mm-hmm. you try to go to the essence by more or less questioning the very concepts that you're using. Mm-hmm. No, the, the very concept that you're using. Mm-hmm. And we, parallel to this one, she gave an advice regarding, I think this is w- w- one of her primary contributions on judgment, mm-hmm. even if that's an unfinished project. Mm-hmm. But from uh, The Promise of Politics, when she discussed the, uh, the issue of prejudice, of mm-hmm. prejudgments. Mm-hmm. So for Hannah Arendt, we have judgments. Okay? We have prejudgments. We have assumptions. Mm-hmm. And everyone shares a prejudice. She spares none. Every not because we are all not be, not because we are all defective, but for mm. Arendt, prejudice is a necessary thing to handle reality. You you simply mm. cannot deliberate all day, all night. Okay? You mm. you you are armed with certain prejudgments, certain assumptions mm. that have been built upon experience. Okay? Mm. So for Arendt, in order for you to think deeper, mm. you need to examine whether your prejudgments are still factually correct, mm. whether your prejudgments are still reflective of reality. Mm-hmm. So you need to constantly yeah. examine that one. And mm-hmm. the dangerous example that she provided would be how to handle prejudice against race. Yeah. And she, mm-hmm. she argued that if you want to handle prejudice, or you know what, I'm going to quote it, because it's, mm-hmm. uh, uh, according to her, one of the reasons for the power and danger of prejudices lies in the fact that something of the past is always hidden within them. Upon mm-hmm. closer examination, we, real, uh, we realize that a genuine prejudice always conceals one mm-hmm. previously formed judgment which Mm -hmm. originally had its own appropriate and legitimate experiential basis Mm -hmm. and which evolved into prejudice only because it was dragged through time without its Mm -hmm. being re-examined or revised. So basically, Mm -hmm. at the core of a prejudice lies a certain truth. So Mm -hmm. for for Arendt, I I, I would quote this one, if we want to dispel prejudices, Mm -hmm. we must first discover the past judgments contained within them, which is to Mm -hmm. say we must reveal whatever truth lies within them. If we neglect to do this, whole battalions of enlightened orators and entire libraries of brochures will achieve Mm. nothing, as is made eminently clear by the truly endless and endlessly fruitless efforts to deal with issues burdened with ancient prejudices, such as the problem of the Jews or of Negroes in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's how you handle prejudice. You recognize Mm -hmm. that there's a historical truth behind it. Mm -hmm. And that is irritating for many people. So yeah. Mo yan, no? Ka, no? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm actually ah. reading from the Promise of Politics right now. I just know where to find it. And that's uh-huh. usually my advice to my students. You don't need to memorize shit. You just need to know where to find shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I have a bookmark in the ready. I actually, well, I remember uh, even in the in the human condition, she distinguishes mm. two important things, which is vita activa, be, being, mm. of course, active in the public sphere, but also a balance with vita contemplativa, which mm. is the contemplative life and the necessity for thinking. You know, And this is often, well, this, can, this is also a possible pitfall uh, wherein there's a, a usual misgiving with regards to thinking that perhaps you can be uh, paralysis by analysis, mm. or you can be stuck in your ivory tower. But she also recognizes the need for that because uh, uh, even with in the life of the mind, she says that a lot of thinking has to do with making present, which is uh, something that is absent. In other words, Mm. you play around with concepts that are not necessarily there. So it's even using your imagination. And even she even says that um, that mathematics 
is simply playing around with numbers. You know, you're not talking about like one mango or two bananas. You're just talking about ones and twos and ideas, and you're able to say how they interact with one another. So, um, of course, the, this is thinking with abstract concepts, maybe metaphysical ones, but this eventually they uh, are applied in real life you know that mm. i think this is a necessity where in thinking needs to be separated from everyone else and that you're able to have that conversation with yourself that is often when you have that moment of criticizing your own yeah. arguments your own prejudices even as a, if you're not necessarily uh in the presence of say mm. for example that racial minority you dislike <laughs> or that uh, opposing party you dislike you mm. perhaps you, you should be able to prepare for their arguments even in their absence yeah, yeah, yeah. so that, that's the fair point of thinking you know even if in their absence you should that's that's training you know of yeah, thinking. but, the, but I'm, I'm just curious uh, mm. do you have any prejudices that you were able to break uh, uh, la, 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 la. Uh, prejudice I was able to break honest well I normally have prejudices against woke students you know and every time i see a a, a video about screaming university student uh, students with colored hair and uh yeah colored hair uh colored, uh and, you know gender ambiguous um pronouns on their handles you know it's like oh they're probably these people who are again who promote their progressive politics in a totalizing and simplifying way. But at the same time, it is fun to actually talk to them and saying, normally I just respond, are you sure? <laughs> and I just watch them <laughs> like, um, like just get flustered because it's clear that sometimes they haven't examined their own thing. Because I just asked the student, and we were talking about sexual harassment. And then she, there was a claim that saying, all women are being sexually harassed every day. So that's a very totalizing, simplifying claim. And I just said, are you sure about that? I said, yes, sir, it's a fact. I said, according to who? <laughs> so, um, of course, it, that process at least allows me to think, oh, they're, they're just people who are just learning to think, you know? And the fact that, well, that's because of my, that's combined with my, uh, capacity as a teacher to know that students are still learning uh, with regards to prejudices to be honest like even with regards to other adults I don't really have that many prejudices so there's mm -hmm. not really a lot to break mm -hmm. uh, but I am actually even curious as to I, I have an empty like, empty slate actually Where? and I said what is going on like how do you think mm -hmm. that's what I want to do I want to talk and I suppose that's part of like my tendency to want to have that conversation. You know, that's uh, that, like thinking in dialogue and thinking in public. You know, I think we need to have that attitude or that habit as political Listen. people to think in public, to make sense of something, and allow yourself to make mistakes in public. Uh, yeah. Even yeah, so because okay. it's because you're trying to make sense of things with your fellow citizens. So I don't know. I mean, if you're trying to ask me about prejudices, eh, I can't think of any except for woke students. But okay, okay, again, okay. that's balanced out with my attitude as a teacher. So okay, okay, okay. My, again, the definition of prejudice for Aaron is just a prejudgment. So mm. isn't that isn't the prejudice behind your want to talk to people is a prejudgment that you 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 actually assume that they actually want to talk. <laughs> Isn't that a, mm. that's a prejudgment? Not not all people are capable of talking like you know talking intensely and such. So is, isn't that a prejudgment? Anyway, that, that just just to nah, just, 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 yeah, just just to mess with well, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a again, it's a tabula rasa. If I try to talk to them, I talk to them, and we'll see. You know, I I don't assume anything. Um, you, mm. you assume that they're willing to talk. I think <laughs> if if they're not, then they're not. But if you assume that they're not, then that is your assumption, you know. Right. So that's your prejudice, then. No, but honestly, I can... anyway, just to just to mess with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, anyway. you, because you spoke of someone else's prejudice, not yours. Mm. Anyway, I do have I... a prejudice towards people with prejudices. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, but you know, mm. for for my case, you know, something that I had to make peace with was you know mm. my my, pre my prejudgments against elites. Hmm. So again, I think that prejudgment is still alive right now. Oh, clearly, it's it's, it's qualified. 
So mm. I need to ha- I need to recognize that there are democratic elites. So that's reality mm. telling me that elites can be democratic, but uh, most of them are not. So they can be, mm. but most of them are not. So you just cannot trust elites with the democracies. But mm. some of them you can. Some of them you can. Most of Again, them. remember you called Bonifacio an elite, despite him being a father of our nation, so, ideally a republic. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, but, but again, it's it's allowing which elites to. Yeah. yeah, it's allowing reality to the nuances of reality play to out affect our assumptions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, that uh, to be honest, it's a real prejudice, not with students, but even people on. Again, I've I've gone into Twitter just to get into the into the fray, you know, in, down and dirty. And there are people. I do talk with people with uh, with their pronouns on their handles, <laughs> and there are some people who are capable of talking back. You know, uh, and they're not just uh, uh, students with. Um, slogans there are people with who can talk with experiences or their anecdotes from people they've they've talked to so there's always someone there's always someone with something to say on the other side you know something of some some substantive to say so i don't know i i i I don't know i i've begun with always with that assumption but even i'm surprised sometimes when you think that um oh this person is non-binary it's like hmm and you'd expect them to say the same slogans, but in mm. fact, they process it themselves. So yeah. you can trust even in them that uh, there are people who are capable of defending themselves. Yeah. Because it's weird like to be forced to defend your own, for example, gender or your own uh, economic class. It is offensive for some people, but mm. some people would be able to stand their ground. And I think that's a product of being practicing thinking, of contemplating and reflecting on their own life. I think that's we, what, something we can learn from Aaron. You, you have to contemplate on your lives because you don't always get to uh, talk to people that don't agree with you. In fact, that mm. can be dangerous sometimes when you actually talk to them like maybe a DDS and say that you don't like the third day. <laughs> that can be very dangerous <laughs> to, to certain relationships. If you're trying to keep up with relationships, you know, not maybe among family members or among friends. Anyway, so yeah. I suppose... That's thinking, you know, that's so any uh, final thoughts on Hannah Arendt and political thinking? So what can Hannah Arendt teach Filipinos in the way that they think? Is there much to learn for for Filipinos uh, Uh, with regards to Hannah Arendt? There is. Arendt in Manila is Mm -hmm. basically Arendt appealing to our you know, to, to, to our want to think and our even our capacity to think. We, we can, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the Bobotante is just one of the bullshits created by mm-hmm. totalitarian liberals, but mm-hmm. uh, we can think, but mm-hmm. uh, we judge thinking based on practical matters. Mm-hmm. But one thing that we can do to intensify how mm-hmm. we think is to think dangerously. And I think this is mm-hmm. one of the th- primary things that I've learned from Aaron and reading Aaron is dangerous thinking. And uh, dangerous thinking is different from thinking about dangerous stuff because you, an, anyone can think about dangerous stuff, you know. Uh, anyone can think about taboo or just some dangerous issues. You can think mm-hmm. about it, but it doesn't mean that you're thinking dangerously. But what, what does it mean to think dangerously? Mm-hmm. To think dangerously for Hannah Arendt, and I think this is reflective in what I have uh, quoted a while ago regarding prejudice. Thinking dangerously is about, it's a two-way thing. First way is you look out, okay? you look out and you spare none from criticism. Mm. And I think this is something that she shares with Marx as well. Mm. You spare none from criticism. Even mm. the most widely held argument or concept, mm. even if it is a traditional concept, even if it is something popularly shared, mm. doesn't mean that it's right. Mm. So you need to subject it to criticism mm-hmm. in order to assert it. That's why I think she got flack with Eichmann in Jerusalem. Yeah. Because the, the popular opinion at that time was Eichmann was the embodiment of what is evil, along with the Nazi mm-hmm. regime. Yet the banality mm-hmm. of evil, the banality of evil, and she she exposed this reality by going against popular opinion, and she shows that mm-hmm. Eichmann was merely doing his job. So evil itself can it's not only about a, it's not about morality per se, but it can be a political structure. And this is something that mm-hmm. this is a reality that she exposed because she went against popular mm-hmm. opinion. So. Right. We, so that's one part. You look outside, you spare none from criticism. You, you just mm-hmm. spare none. And mm-hmm. that goes back to ourselves, which is you, you don't spare yourself from criticism. Mm-hmm. So your prejudices, they're useful. 
prejudices mm. are not necessarily good. They're not necessarily evil. Mm. They can be evil if and only if they're no longer aligned with reality. So mm-hmm. we need to constantly check if our assumptions are correct, if our assumptions mm-hmm. are still aligned with right. reality. So that's dangerous thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if even if you think about dangerous stuff, I mean, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. already attacking the, the left right here again. Yeah, okay. Activists, leftists, they think about dangerous stuff all day. And I applaud mm-hmm. them for that. They, mm-hmm. they think about it and they, to an extent, act in response to it. But can they question their doctrines? Can they question mm-hmm. their dogmas? Can, their, can they question their own traditions? So, yeah. And again, Mao yeah. would come in. Self-criticism is mm-hmm. necessary. You need to wash your face every now and then. So even mm-hmm. Mao would reflect mm-hmm. such matters. So, so yeah. dangerous thinking, just, just, to, just for our listeners, dangerous mm-hmm. thinking is not about the object that you are thinking about. Mm-hmm. It's about how you think. Mm-hmm. It, right. It, you know, just to continue on that, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem is famous for the concept of the banality of evil, wherein mm. evil is not necessarily always the radical, violent acts, mm. you know, but mostly just being refusing refusal to think and just follow orders because that's the common line that the Nazis on trial were doing. They're just following mm. orders. And she was, she was trying to expect this villain, but it was just uh, an ordinary person well, it's funny, like it, it, in the movie, she said it's a human being that refused to be a person. <laughs> her, a person is a, capable of thinking. And if when you refuse to think, then you, know, you relinquish your humanity mm. and therefore you're capable of doing anything. So that's, that's something very poetic that is present like in Hannah Arendt's thought. But at the same time, it's not necessarily, well, when you criticize, therefore you find something wrong. You, mm. It's not necessarily just to destroy it because sometimes when you hear criticize, the word criticize yeah. can be violent and can be very mm. have them to get connotation. We're not very we're comfortable with that. But really, I think one thing that Hannah Arendt uh, highlights in her own thought is again the preservation of plurality and the, which in in the space called the world called Amor Mundi, which is love of the world, and the world is where we live together and share a common system, a common structure, a common public sphere. Mm. So in, we have to debate each other in order to live with one another. We only know how to live with one another if we talk and work out our difference. Wow. It's fluffy. But that's the point. It's not criticism just to tear people down, but in order to build a world, world together. Mm. But sometimes that involves, I don't know, um, it involves giving and taking. You know, mm. with one another. So that's part of being compromised. So it's weird. Like when you see some of her in- interviews, she said she is not capable of love <laughs> except for her love for friendships, you know, mm. so, or her friends. Right. Uh, friends because, yeah, the, maybe. But maybe Heidegger broke her heart. But really, <laughs> yeah. But I suppose that's one love she's capable of, which is, uh, you know, with the political sense, love in the political sense. Although in general, love in romantic love, she believes is not, <laughs> it's not, it's apolitical and it destroys politics. But yeah, I, I suppose Amor Mundi is, she's trying to um, search for that kind of love that preserves the world. That's Amor Mundi. Mm. So perhaps what we can do moving forward is of course, criticize ourselves and criticize each other relentlessly, but in mm. order to build a common world together, not necessarily mm. to tear each other down because of course she fought against that hmm. violence and violence in itself. People think that violence is political, but it's precisely the opposite. It's violence is anti-political. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I think that's a big one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Verbal violence or physical ones? I don't know. That's uh, more than an hour of to- uh, at least summarizing yeah. an Aaron's thought about thinking. Um, and uh, and how it can be applied to the Philippines, you know. Actually, it's uh, yeah, Philippine. One last thing on Philippine culture. Yeah, I, I think a lot of Philippine culture uh, bypasses uh, talking. I don't know how to talk about politics. Like oh. even in group chats, it's like I don't know politics in family in dinner table. But I suppose Hannah Arendt kind of pushes us to do that and saying, mm. let's talk about it, but also in yeah. a well, in a cordial way, at the very least, even if you can relentlessly take down, mm. you, there, you also know that there are people there. Uh, so, shall we move? 
Yeah. Hey, re- so, regarding what do you that, say about that culture? Uh, yeah. Some some last points regarding that culture. Again, we, that must be qualified mm. by general data that Filipinos are not mm. they're not afraid of talking about politics. So, so they're not afraid. So we, we like we do like to talk about politics. But then, then again, selective uh, instances. Mm. You know, when to one, man, mm-hmm. politica yan, uh-uh. pero we also have spaces. Kaya sa barbero, di ba? Yeah, kaya sa barbero. <laughs> so we were not afraid to so talk grab about driver politics. Grab driver mo, di ba? Yeah, kaya nga, that's why Aaron, we can learn much from Aaron because we are not afraid to talk about politics. Mm-hmm. Filipinos are not generally afraid to talk about politics. That's why we can we can learn much from her. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing regarding, uh, I think we, 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 we mentioned this one during our pre-prod that uh, Aaron is breaking down an ivory tower. Mm. So what she is establishing is an acropolis, you know, they say mm. above the forum, but still tied with the forum. Uh-huh. So it's mm. a place for us to just stop talking for a while, go up to the, uh, <laughs> go up to the acropolis and start thinking before we go down again to the forum. So, so instead of an ivory tower, which is really high and inaccessible, yeah. it fits other people, you know. Yeah. You can talk to people. You can, you know, wrestle even wrestle with ideas. Uh, yeah. That's 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 the metaphor. So, umakyat din tayo. That was magsama sama tayo at magusap. <laughs> oh, so yeah, it's very Greek, despite her being a yeah. German Jew. No, we, so, we 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 go up and think. We go up and think. Mm. Then we go down to the forum and start speaking. Yeah. So Greek. I'm trying. Well, is the well is the Acropolis? I, I'm I'm trying. I'm confused. The Acropolis is supposed to be collective, right? That's yeah, well. it's also collective. But uh, you yeah. you're you're there not really to speak, but to but to uh, but to think and worship the goddess mm. of wisdom. Mm. So it's it's a place uh, you you speak and you negotiate in the forum. <laughs> mm. Actually, you, we they also talk also in private, right? Yeah. Like you, you mentioned that you, we usually talk in spaces. Like yeah. well, it's a private thing when you have your haircut. Yeah. You talk with your in the privacy of the grab or taxi. Yeah. But sometimes we also have to it's so that is in a way pre-political. Yeah. Where you can have these conversations to yeah. practice thinking, yeah. and then you could do that in the pub the public sphere. Yeah. So it goes both ways. So, yeah. I, I think it's a problem with democracy in a way. We let leave that talking with our representatives. We ourselves can do that. We can, ourselves yeah. can talk to our politicians. Okay, so that we can go. On and on, I, I bet. Yeah. But let's move on, I think, for... Let me do recommendations. I mean, we've already recommended... Okay, we're recommending more Hannah Arendt stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think we... we I, I don't think we have any separate recommendations. I think we can just recommend the entire list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. List. So we, we talked about the human condition, mm. promise of politics, yeah. origins of totalitarianism, and... Thinking without uh, minister. Thank you. Yes, and the life of the mind. But I think, yeah. additionally... Of course, yeah. yeah. Can... Wait, it's not very readable, but it's, it adds context. The Eichmann in Jerusalem, yeah, where that was a banality of evil, where she almost almost canceled. Yeah, I do want. Okay, there's this also. They they also sell this one, uh, freedom to be free. Mm. Uh, it's quite cheap. A Penguin Classics. It talks. Mm. It includes three lectures on the topic, and I'd also want to highly. Uh, recommend might you disagree with this? The movie Hannah Arendt, yeah, go you know, ahead. where yeah, she has good. this great. Each, especially in the end, where of course she defended what she had to say about uh, Eichmann, and she was against not only her students but also the Jewish community and fellow Jewish yeah. professors. So, uh, and she held her own in saying that, uh, and oh, this is very important, and I think this is a very important quote: "Understanding is not the same as forgiveness." Mm. She tried to understand Eichmann as a Nazi. Hmm. But she th- that doesn't mean she forgave him. And that's what they thought. When trying to explain Eichmann, they thought you were trying to humanize him. In a way, she did. But hmm. it's not to, it does not do away with what the evil that he's done. He under- she understood how she, he, uh, he was able to do such evil acts. So I think that's an important thing we have to do. Yeah. We have to understand. But that doesn't mean that you necessarily forgive people. Yes. You can understand Marcos Apologist's uh, violent kakampinks and uh, DDS. Hmm. But you have it's a duty to understand them, but not necessarily forgive them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that, yeah. Then we, we are threading on dangerous paths where liberals would argue with it again. But yeah, you're you're right. Can, can, can we recommend something that is not Aaron but related to Aaron? I'm gonna go ahead. I can recommend <laughs> I, I will recommend a book by her ex. <laughs> <laughs> is her Nazi ex-boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm recommending uh if you can find a copy, I think there are some available, but uh, well, there are a lot. Martin Heidegger's what is called thinking. Mm-hmm. 
So in this book, I think this book was written post-war and Aaron mm -hmm. provided a, a blurb for it. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. kaita ba, kaita Not ba too bitter. <laughs> but uh, uh -huh. both Heidegger and Aaron shared this love, not only for the classics, but mm. also a love for thinking. Mm. And in the book, Heidegger posited the question, are we actually thinking? Mm. So, so yeah, I would leave that mm -hmm. to our listeners. So mm -hmm. even Heidegger himself argued, are we actually thinking? Mm -hmm. And then he says, I know that you would answer yes, but let us go through it. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm recommending that one, a book by yeah. your ex. <laughs> well, her response there is that we think whether we like it or not. The important thing is <clears> to... <throat> to think dangerously as we said or think effectively but of course it's important to get a debate i think it was a question that he uh brought up first but aaron in a yeah. way elaborated on yeah. uh we, we we think whether we know it or not <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that <laughs> is it for this very special uh, episode on our intellectual idol, but of course, I think uh, we criticized her to a point. Uh, no, no, so not, not idol, uh, intellectual inspiration or influence. Influence, <laughs> I didn't yon. I put influence. <laughs> oh, but yeah, we like she's special to us. Hopefully, she'll be special to you as well. And just a lot to learn from, even if they're not your political influence. There's always something to be had or to be mm. gained from reading her, and we hope yeah. you enjoy it the same way we did or maybe to any extent whatsoever and so yeah uh so Ooh, love please you <laughs> <laughs> the pi podcast can be found on youtube anchor and spotify and if you have any questions comments or suggestions regarding our show please email us at pi podcast ph at gmail.com but until the next episode magandang gabi mga pi